Do you remember Minesweeper? This game that if you grew up in my generation or maybe a little older, it was this game that we love to play. You just click and you click and then things happen and you click again and then you die. But then you, you start over and you click again and you click and click and you're trying to figure out how does this work? But inevitably you find yourself dying. Guys, let's try this again. Okay, you never thought that you would see me play Minesweeper on Rise on Fire, right? Okay, well, it's happening. Today it's happening. And there's a purpose for it happening. Trust me, we're going to get to that in a moment here. But let me win this game. Um, see, this game is something that you can play over and over and over. And you start realizing, wow, there's, there's these numbers. And it seems like the bombs are close to these numbers. As a child playing this, this is how far I got. A few tries in and I just blow up and I'd blow up and I'd try again and I'd blow up. And even though I knew there was something to do with these numbers getting higher, bombs being close to it, it wasn't until I grew up one day and actually read the rules that I realized how this actually works. And so I want to submit to you that is how it is with life. We go through life knowing, feeling like, we're inevitably gonna die. There's a bomb that we're gonna click on. All of us are heading for that place. And so we try our best to learn by experience. We click here, we click there, we hope to figure something out, but we make mistakes, we make mistakes, we make mistakes. And we keep doing it like a child, like the child I was, believing that one day suddenly things are gonna be different and suddenly life's gonna be just prosperous in the ways that I inwardly believe that God has for me. But I want to submit to you that the only way for you to figure this out is for you to learn the rules. It's for you to know how this game of life works. And most specifically, the minds that the enemy is planting in your mind. See, the enemy is planting traps. He is trying to come and bring thoughts and lies and deceitful schemes. He has many of those. And he is attempting to trick you into a place where you think that you can figure this out. Trying the same thing over again. Let's just be honest, guys. How far has that gotten you? You're looking around you and you're seeing these issues in your life that you know very well have been going on for way too long. And yet, what are you going to do about those things? I want to submit to you that if we want to start making an impact in the world around us with the calling of God, the gifts of God, with all the purposes of God that he has given us, which is massive and big and powerful, like you listening to this, you have a powerful calling on your life. Do you recognize that? Do you understand that? But at the same time, that means that the enemy all the more so is looking to steal that away from you by distracting you, by getting you to explode with fear and worry, like walking on a minefield. Imagine this, a minefield where people have planted mines. You're walking in this territory. You know the next step may be your last. It may be that the next step is the mine itself and you're walking in fear and trembling not led by the spirit, but led by your own flesh. That's why you're in fear and trembling. But if only you started to realize that you have a father who's in heaven, who knows where every mine is, and that the only way for you to pass through this field is by him illuminating that to you by his spirit being the one to guide you in and through the place of life that you're in right now. And so it is a time for the people of God to rise up and take back the territories that were lost to the enemy because of the fear that he has come and put on, put inside of us. So I want to start off by reading Genesis three, verse one, learning about what the enemy does. It says this. Now this serpent, he was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the women, did God actually say you shall eat, not eat of the tree of the garden? Now, 
First, two things. First, we see that he is the most crafty, more crafty than any other beast. Anything out there, he is more crafty. So that means that beware of his craftiness. That's the warning. And then we see what is his craftiness. It's what he tries here. He says, did God actually say? Now, I know that many of us know of this verse. We, we've, we've repeated this. We've, we're familiar with this. But but I want you to think about what that means. What did God actually say? He's really questioning the word of God. He's also making you question whether you remember the word of God correctly. He's making you wonder whether the word of God can be trusted. He's making he's putting questions all in your mind, even to, even if you believe the word of God, do you understand it correctly? And all of these doubts, these doubts come in. But yet when the Messiah was in the wilderness and the enemy came to him in his hard place, we see what does he do? He knows the word and he keeps repeating the word of God over and over and over again as the enemy is coming up. All of these thoughts, all of these lies. See, this is the plan of the enemy. He has a plan to create an environment where fearful thinking can foster. See, in the garden, now let me just get this straight with you. Like, there, it doesn't, it doesn't mean we don't need a certain environment for fear to come in, but he wants to place us in that environment. And then when we are there, he is hoping to come after. See, when when the Messiah was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, it says he was led there to be tempted by the devil. And so the devil came in that environment that was dry and difficult. And as Yeshua was was being like, that's a hard place. That's the opportune moment. See, the, 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 the scripture says that the 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 Satan is like a lion walking to and from seeking whom he may devour. And so that means that he, a lion, you know, when you think about a lion, a lion walks and he's looking for the prey that is downcast, the prey that is injured, the prey that is weak. And in the opportune moment, because the lion doesn't have the stamina, what it does is it goes for that that weak prey, right? And so then he goes after the prey and he attacks. See, in your weakest moment is when Satan comes to attack. And what are your weakest moments? What are those environments that he desires to entrap us in? Well, it can be many things, but let's just think of, like realistically. When I was a child, I remember one of the things that I fell into, as many children do, is I started getting nightmares. Terrible night terrors, in fact, where they became demonic. I became attacked in my sleep. And this and Satan wanted to do that in order to put fear of darkness inside of me so that my calling of the future to cast darkness out of people and to set the captives free would not prosper in my life because I would be too scared of entering that calling because I'm scared of the darkness. As many, some of you may be scared of, of demons, scared of darkness. Scared. I'm not scared of darkness. Darkness is scared of me because the word of God, the spirit of God is inside of me, the spirit and the truth. And if he's put his spirit inside of me, because of that authority, darkness must flee. But maybe it's not that. Maybe you grew up and somewhere along the line of life, you fell into a place where you were abused physically, emotionally, spiritually. And suddenly that was an environment where fear came in to your life. Maybe it was that you were abandoned or you felt rejected by a parent or by by a spouse or or as a friend or by an authority figure in your life, you felt rejected. And so the fear of rejection, the fear of man came in. And even if we go a little deeper, even the darker sects and cults and movement, the things like satanic ritual abuse, their their whole objective is to create a initiation ceremony that is dark and full of fear in order to create an environment where the spirit of fear can enter and where your heart can be captivated by fear 
so that you can be controlled by fear. But has the scriptures not said that our God, our Father, has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind? Power, love, and a sound mind. And so, therefore, now, if that is the case, that means that if trauma comes to place fear in our heart, what is the purpose of that? Why is the enemy trying to do that? See, what he wants to do is he wants us to be like him. He wants he knows that we were created in the image of God. So he's going to try and create us in the image of him, of our enemy, of Satan, for us to think like Satan, for us to always be fearful, for always to be thinking uh, angry, anger thoughts, for us to be always in distress, for us to be always uh, pointing the finger at others, for us to be all think about what, what is what is the emotions of Satan? See, that's what he wants to give you. However, if you recognize that love has come to cast out fear from you, then that is there to make you think like God, because when fear is cast out, the spirit of God, who whom the Lord has given us, will make us more into the image of God. See, to be made into the image of God is first a spiritual thing. It is to think like he does, to act like he does. And you can only think and act like he does if you have the spirit of him and not the spirit of the world or the spirit of fear that the enemy is trying to put in you through all of the baggage and all the stuff that we've gone through. Now, listen, we've all gone through stuff. We're all going to go through stuff. Going through stuff is part of the deal. The Messiah said that tribulation and trial is promised. If they hated me, they will hate you as well. Right. These are given. So we're not the objective of all of this is not for us to to just never experience trials. The question is, is when trial come, what do you allow it to do to you? Do you allow it to mold you into the image of Satan or into the image of Yeshua, of Jesus? It's going to do one of two things. And it's going to depend on this battlefield in your mind. The thoughts in here is going to determine what happens out here. So when you go through trauma, when you go through trial, what are you going to allow in? Because your mind is like an antenna and all of these thoughts are coming. Some are from the kingdom of darkness, some from the kingdom of light, and some are just like from your own flesh. And you're going to, and this is happening all day long, every day. You know this. I know this. If you've been a human being for more than five seconds, you know this. And so when these thoughts come, what is, what is your choice? Your choice is, am I going to monitor? Am I going to audit? What kingdom? I have this thought. What kingdom is it from? Who is saying this? And if you do this every day, perhaps then we can start weeding out what is from God and what is not. Because if you allow the enemy to come and hurt you by making you think more like he does, what's going to happen is that saying hurt people, hurt people, you get hurt. And so you become a person of hurt. And you start expressing hurt to everyone else and your hurt becomes your excuse somehow for who you are. But just yet the Messiah went through Jesus went through hurt. He went through betrayal more than many of us. He was hung on a tree. He had every right to to be the fulfillment of her people, her people by our logic. But no, in the kingdom of God, that would never be an excuse that we could use. Rather, he said, if they hurt you, turn the other cheek. Wow, what? If they take one thing, like give them more. They ask you to walk one mile, walk ten. All right. These these acts of love, somehow the Messiah knew that in actually loving your enemy, that will be your deliverance. Hold up. Did you just hear what I said? You not allowing the enemy or your enemy, the enemy that is spiritual or maybe an enemy that is physical. If you allow them to come and like, okay, I'm going to love you regardless. I'm not going to respond the way you expect me to respond. 
And then in that love, I get set free. I get delivered. I'm the one who doesn't get put in bondage. But if I respond with the image of Satan, if I respond in hatred, if I respond in disgust, if I don't, if I'm not kind, if I'm not gentle, if I'm not all the fruits of the spirit, if I operate in the fruits of the flesh, I am now operating from the flesh and I will move from flesh to flesh instead of from victory to victory. And I will be more in bondage than ever before because perfect love casts out fear. You seeing the love of the Messiah of Jesus and you expressing the love that he had for his enemies for you, you doing that for your enemies now. That is going to mean that you're going to experience the deliverance of Jesus in your life. You're going to experience perfect love and and fear is going to be cast out from your life. See, we can't just pray the fear away, guys. You can't just go from place to place, minister to minister, church to church, demon of fear leave, demon and spirit of fear leave. Like, look, yes, there is a spirit of fear that can be cast out. Hallelujah. However, if you don't start loving That spirit of fear is going to just come back, make home again, because the spirit of fear comes to the temple of hatred, the temple that's full of fruits of flesh. But the spirit of God comes to the temple of love, the temple of the Holy Spirit. That is the fruits of the spirit and the tree, right? Like, like if you have the fruits of the spirit on your temple, on your tree, that's the place where the spirit is dwelling and moves from. If you have the fruits of the flesh, well, Yeshua said, you will know the tree by its fruit. So if you carry fruits of the flesh, you, you're not a vassal of the Holy Spirit. You, you become a vassal of something else. So you have to be like, God, I'm going to choose to lay my life down, my, lay my desires down. Look, I want to hate like it is in our nature to hate it's in our nature to respond in in the ways that the world expects us to respond but it is in the holy spirit's nature in yeshua's nature in the kingdom of god's nature to love those even who hate us the, the sinners and tax collectors they love those who love them back what's special about that but it's when we love in and out of season that that's what makes us different and so let's move on See, I want to submit to you, brothers and sisters, that the normal Christian or normal believer's response to negative emotions, negative feelings, bad things that we go through, it's to bury those things because we consider those things unacceptable. And what I mean is, just hear me out here. We say, it's as a believer, we're not allowed to worry. Or as a believer, we're not allowed to feel something negative like stress, right? Or, you know, whatever it is. And so then we, what we do is, okay, oh, I'm a believer. Oh, I'm feeling or I'm experiencing this. Oh, no, no, no. And then we bury it. We pretend like it's not there because it's unacceptable, right? But see, that's exactly what the enemy wants. Because you burying something that is to be passive, but just kind of push it aside. That's not dealing with it. That's burying it. And when you bury it, you're not dealing with it. That means you bury it in your soul. And some of you listening, you've buried things for 20 years. You've buried things for 30 years. Things that have happened to you 20 years ago, legitimately, you've buried. And you've never dealt with it because It was the unacceptable thing to experience for you. And so we tell ourselves that if I, or maybe it was just such a horrific thing or experience that, that you just want to forget about it. Right. And and that's understandable in one sense. However, the Messiah didn't say, just forget about it. He said something more specific than that. He said, give your burdens to me. He said, you see, not deal with it yourself. Forget about it. No, deal with it, face it. Now, let's let's look at some of the ways that we can face that. When we have things that have happened to us, like I said, the main priority of the enemy is to bring in lies. We see with people who were abused, oftentimes one of the lies that comes in, it's it's your fault. You're the one who who caused that person to abuse you. Blame yourself. Or let's just say that you were rejected by a, a, a father or mother, then the lie comes and says, 
of the enemy says, well, you're not worthy. That's why you're not worth being loved. You're not worth being accepted. That's the lie. So whatever your situation is, there's going to come a lie. What did you do with that lie? Because if you just kind of passively went through it, that lie is going to be like situated in your heart, in your soul. It's going to be welcomed, whether you like it or not, or know it or not. But because if you do not reject the devil, he won't flee. But if you reject him, he will flee. That's why Jesus said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. If you do not, though, for, though resist the devil, guess what? He does not flee. But you've been given authority to resist him. So use the authority to resist him and resist him. And even if you did not resist him before and he's come in or a lie that he has spoken has come in. Now you can resist him. Now you can look back and resist and speak the truth of God's word, because it is what that sets you free. The truth that sets you free. So therefore, if you believe a lie in order to be set free from the lie, you have to know and speak the truth. And then you're set free from the lie. And so this is why the scriptures tell us to pray continually. I want to open one Thessalonians 5, 16. Guys, this is super important. All of this here tonight. I hope that you're going to share this with your friends because the body needs this. Hallelujah. Like this. There are so many people in bondage in their heart, soul, mind and in their strength. And they're struggling to love God and their neighbor because of all this stuff. OK, let's go on. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, and he says this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Hold up. Look at that. Pray without ceasing. What is that? That praying is to speak to God. He says, speak to God all day long. Just speak to God. Going in from place, out of place, from moment to moment, speak to God, Lord. And see, our prayer can be an intentional moment of getting with you and God, getting on your knees and speaking to him. Hallelujah. That's awesome. Then there's also simply just praying throughout the day. It doesn't always have to be formal prayer, praying without ceasing. Lord, help me here. Lord, help me there. Guide me here. Give me words or God. There's a thought that just entered here. Lord, is this of you? No, wait, this is not of you, God. This is of the enemy. This is not of you in accordance to your word. So, Lord, I resist this thought. I cause it out, Lord. I thank you that you don't say that, but you say this. You don't say I'm not worthy. That's Satan. You tell me I'm worthy. By what you've done for me, you tell me I'm worthy. All right, then he says this. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. So make sure that you keep giving thanks. Then he says this. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecy. Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Okay, We've been talking about testing whatever comes into your mind. Test, 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 test. What is good? Hold fast. What is not? Don't hold fast. Resist it. And then he says, abstain from every form of evil. Now, I want you to see some, a, par a, a parallel here or a, a connection here. He's talking about uh, three things here that I want you to see. That is to speak to God, praying. Do not quench the spirit. What does the spirit do? The spirit speaks to us and through us. And he says, do not despise prophecies. Prophecy is how the word of God goes forth. It is the, the, the way of the voice of God goes forth. See, we need the gift of prophecy today in our congregations. We need it in individuals who can speak forth to one another. Uh, the words of God, like, and we need the word of God itself. That is the Bible. But God desires to speak through us through his word, his truth, the Bible. He got any desires to speak through us through his spirit, spirit and truth, not just the truth, not just the Bible, but also his spirit. And we grow in our relationship with the father and we grow in our relationship with the Holy Spirit, learning to hear his voice, learning to discern and not quenching his spirit in our life. Therefore, see, brothers and sisters, God desires to speak through us through his spirit. And the spirit is always going to speak to us in accordance to the word of God. But his spirit desires to speak to us. Hallelujah. Like, like our God is alive. Our God is not just a book. Our God has given us his word and speaks through us through it. But he is alive and he wants to speak through us through dreams and visions and prophecies through our prayer life with him. He speaks to us. And if he's not speaking to you in any way of those ways, 
draw near to him and ask him, seek him out, because he has said in Acts chapter 2, in these days, I will speak in these ways through dreams and visions and prophecies to my people. And that's what he wants us to do to help us in our time of need. All right. And not, so that's the first way thing that we should be doing in this battle. If you want to figure out how to play that 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 game that we started with, like this is how you play this one. Like when the enemy comes and plants minds, you're going to ask the Holy Spirit. You're going to go to the word of God and you're going to learn what the truth is. And you're going to continue to be in prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to help you with thought, with every thought that comes to mind. So you know where it comes from. Next, I want you to see this strategy, and it is that of journaling. Now, this is what I mean. When you have things in your past, like we discussed a little earlier, where there's things that you've gone through in your, you know, like five, ten years ago, or maybe a year ago, or maybe six months ago. But this is something that you know is deep, deeply seated in your heart. And perhaps you don't know that it's deeply seated in your heart. The only way for you to really get freedom, and, and I actually think that all of us, every single one of you listening to this here tonight, you're going to have stuff in your past that you may not know is there. I want you to start considering taking some time. And this is just one way, but this is one way is, is write down, say, God, help me like sh- pray, Lord, help me. Show, show me what is there in my past, what is there, what's traumatic, what is hurtful, what is, and write down what you feel, write down what you've experienced, write down the traumas, write down the things people have done to you, write down all of it, as wherever the Holy Spirit leads you, write it down, and you'll be shocked at what comes out onto the page. And when it's written down now, you look at it all, and then you ask, so God, what do you say about this? This is th- this on the page here. Some of it may be true. Some of it may be lies. Maybe it's I'm I don't feel worthy. Maybe it's I feel like no one loves me. Maybe it's is uh, when this person said that to me, I, I got so angry and I still get so angry since that moment in my life. Maybe it's I feel jealous at people and I shouldn't like just be brutally honest. Right. And then. You look at those and you ask, Lord, what is the truth about these? Well, I I don't have to be jealous because you've given me all good things and you have given me things to rejoice in that I can be content in, including a calling. And that is that is going to be timely in my life. Right. And that's going to be powerful in my life. Or maybe it's I'm not worthy. But God, you you've made me worthy by proclaiming that I'm worthy by dying for my sins. And it's not because of what I've done or didn't do. It's because of. Your love for me that makes me worthy of your love. You decide, not me, God. Thank you. Right? Or maybe it's I get angry. Well, well, why do I get angry when my God is not is not angry? He's not a, a person of rage, right? He has our God has righteous anger, of course, but he doesn't walk around enraged and making decisions from rage. And so, Lord. Oh, God, heal me. Lord, I forgive this person that makes me so angry. I forgive my children. And Oh, God, I resist the spirit of anger. I resist the devil who tries to make me angry like he's angry. God, and I repent for being angry. I repent for these actions of anger that I have walked out towards my family or friends or whoever it is. Like, okay, I'm making some examples here so you can see what it's like. And when you move through things this way in your past, you start breaking down the bondages and Satan's grip is is removed from you because it's not just about like a, a, a see brown sisters. What we try and do is behavior modification in our life. We're like, OK, the Bible says I shouldn't be angry, but you keep getting angry. The Bible says I shouldn't be jealous. OK, I know I shouldn't be jealous. Let me try. Let me try. Let me try. But you keep being jealous. Right. Because you have to go to the root of these things, rip out the root by the power of the spirit, not you. Like you're not the one doing this. You're not the one who can do this. You cannot be a good person in of yourself. Like if you could, well, the Holy Spirit didn't ever need to come and descend. God would have been like, okay, cool. You're good. You got this figured out. Just walk like my son. Why are you you struggling? Try harder. 
No, he said, it's good that I go so I can send my spirit to be with you. Because he knew we needed him. He knew we needed to be clothed in power. He knew without his spirit coming in our temples, we are dead in our flesh. We, we, there's nothing in us that's going to be able to do this. But his spirit in us, if we submit to him, if we rely on him, if we depend upon him, man, like he can come and change you from the inside out. Write his law in your heart. Change your nature from this heart of stone to a heart of flesh, which this new creation making you alive in him and dead to the world and the things and the thoughts of the world, making you dead to Satan and alive in Christ. See, Satan wants the old man, the man of sin, the man of this world. He wants that man alive. But Christ has called you to die to that man and be resurrected in you to walk in the spirit, to be alive in him as a resurrected being. See, we're, we're, there's a coming resurrected resurrection where we're all going to be resurrected from the dead, right? Like to be living with him eternally. But he want, he's already come to resurrect you in spirit. He's already come to resurrect you so you can be a voice of resurrection to this lost and dying world. So you can resurrect dead spirits. In other words, people who are dead in their sin, whose spirits are dying. So you can be one who resurrects them, not you and your of yourself, but by the Holy Spirit living in you, who has the power of the resurrection. See, the power of the resurrection lives inside of you. The the way that the Messiah, that Jesus was resurrected from the dead is by the Holy Spirit. So the same spirit that raised him, Christ from the dead, lives in you. That means that he wants to raise you from the dead and he wants to raise others from the dead through your temple. See, you're a Our God's temple is a temple of resurrection, and you are that temple of resurrection, that temple of spirit and truth for all life will flow from. So are you ready to become that temple or are you going to keep living in the in fear of this world and fear of death and fear and fear and fear? And so. I would like for you to keep and I'm going to say a few things regarding what people struggle with here. It's just the spirit leads me here. We already talked about that lie of you are not worthy, but I wanted to just add to that as well that. You know, like you don't get to decide that you're not worthy. You do not get to decide that you do not get to determine your value. I'm sorry, you just don't. The one who made you has the right to do so. Right. The one who made you has the right to determine whether you're worthy. The one who made you has the right to give you a calling, gifting and a personality. And he did. And he gave you the calling, gifting and personality he gave you because he has purpose with it. So you don't have the right to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm not happy because he made you just the way you did with all the strengths and the weaknesses that he gave you so that you can be perfectly powerfully used. And you say, how is that possible? I have so many weaknesses. How can I be used? Just look at me. You're looking at a miracle right now in this moment. Go to another video on this channel and you're looking at another miracle. Because every single one of our videos is a miracle because I my greatest weakness in the flesh is people speaking before people. When I've shared this before, I'll share it again. When I was in and I remember one day I was a kid in primary school. I will never forget this. This was one of the most fearful moments of my life where I had to do an oral speech. And I stood before a class and as I did, I, I, I had this thing memorized. I knew it all well. And yet when I looked upon everyone looking back at me, I forgot everything and shame and condemnation and 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 the and what people think of me. All this stuff just came rushing through my soul and it really controlled me so much so that I couldn't utter a word. I start, I wanted to just cry and run away, basically. And, and that's basically what I did. I just I said the first sentence of my speech and then I just stared back right at everyone. And then I went to have a seat again and the. My teacher never asked me to try and even do that speech again. See, that's who I am. Like in terms of how God made me, like he made me as a, an introverted, shy person. 
He didn't make me fearful, though. See, you can have a personality type. That is who you are, and you don't get to complain about that. But you also should be careful of what the enemy is going to try and push you in because of the weaknesses you suffer. My weakness being more a shy, quiet person was, well, the fear of man coming in. That is the, the, the danger that I suffered and that did come in. But when I one day when the Lord called me and I, I had a choice, OK, he's calling me to speak in front of people. God, I really don't want to do this. But God, I'll do this if this is what you tell me to do. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. No matter how much, no matter how much fear I have. You see, wisdom of the world will tell me, Petey, that's not a good career route for you. That's not a, a good profession. Not, not that it's about profession, but that's not a good uh, avenue for your life to try and make that to the calling of God for you. See, the calling of God sometimes doesn't follow the wisdom of men. And so fear, sometimes we excuse fear and we call it wisdom. We say, oh, I'm being wise because I'm not. Uh, 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 what if what if this and that goes wrong? What if I I'm not really good at that? Or what if something bad happens to me? Maybe it's fear of situations for you. You're in bondage to the fear of situations. In other words, what has happened is you're worrying the worries of men instead of living by faith. You have this all these what ifs, what ifs, what if, what if I lose my job? What if an enemy gets elected? That's something that's going on around right now politically, isn't it? What if I get in an accident? What if my child doesn't come back to God? What if, what if, what if? Worry, worry, worry of the world. Where does that come from? Is that from the kingdom of God? Or is that from Satan's mouth itself? What if you lose your job? Who cares? Is God your provider or are you your provider? What if an enemy gets elected? Who cares? Is God in charge or are you putting trust in some official? See, at the end of the day, this is how I think about things. When there are many risks in this world, we are surrounded by risks. We are surrounded by what ifs. We are you can get in a car today. You can this is one of the most risky things we can do. We we see accidents every day on the roads. How many accidents have you driven by? All of us have. We know there it's risky. That's how life is. It's risky. And people get in accidents, people die. People get disabled. Terrible things happen in life. So I'm not excusing the realities and the burdens and the trials and the difficulties and the traumas and the hurts of life. It is a hard life is difficult. Life is hard. There's many tears that will be shed, and that's why he will wipe those tears away one day. But when I go and I drive, I have all my trust in the Lord. And I'm not going to be like, oh, God, well, what's going to happen? Oh, God, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What, oh, who's going to take care of my wife, my beautiful wife, Christina? Like, what's going to happen to her? Like, oh, oh, like, no, I don't live in fear. I don't live in fear. That's from Satan himself. He wants to control me. No, I have wisdom. I do what's wise. Of course, I'm going to drive the speed limit. Right. I'm going to be careful. But yet I know that if something happens to me, God is for me. Who can be against me? God is for my family. Who can be against me? God takes care of me. Who who's not? He's going to take care of my wife. He's going to have his perfect sovereign purpose and will. See, that's faith. That's that's really trusting in him because man, he's ne he's never left me. He's never forsaken me. Have things sometimes not going to plan? Oh, absolutely. But he's always been there even through those things. And he's helped me overcome those things because in Christ, we're all overcomers. So are you going to here's the question. Are you going to continue living in fear? Or are you going to have faith in God? Are you going to continue to allow this overwhelming fear to control you and your family's lives? Or are you going to start having faith in God? Ooh, come on, guys, we have to, we have to, we have to put faith in God. Maybe it's for you that you feel like, Peter, I don't feel that I'm enough. 
I don't feel like I'm perfect enough that my that I'm good enough in my works. I want to read something to you here, Matthew 546. Okay, we read this. Um, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you regret only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Okay, what he says then. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. This, you know, people have taken this out of context. They've just quoted this one verse over here and they're like, look, you have to be a perfect man. You know what? I'm so grateful that I don't need to be perfect. I don't need to be perfect. Anyway, like, whoa, hold up, PD. Doesn't it say you must be perfect? It just said it right there. Didn't you just read what we just read? Like, be perfect. Be perfect in what? In loving. See, to, to love people is not a burden. To show mercy, to greet people, it's not a burden. It's not that difficult. I mean, look, it, it can be difficult to love an enemy. Don't get me wrong here. But it's not a burden. It's not a, a, a weight. See, he said, my yoke is light and easy. This is what he was talking about. He wants us to love one another. And so when we when he calls us to perfection, see, he says, perfect uh, love casts out fear. So when you are perfect in this way, as our father is perfect in loving us and we start loving people, what's going to happen? Fear is cast out. The fear of the world, fear of. Man, worries of the world, all these things are cast out. This is the key to it, is by loving like he called us to love, being perfect as he called us to be perfect, to love. And, and the more you grow in this love, the more you grant freedom for yourself and your family and those around you because they will just see it and you will help them love because from your love, they love. And it's just like a love everywhere and love grows us all. And love allows us to grow closer to the Father. And so love is the key of Yeshua's ministry and is the key to casting out fear. But also look at what he says now regarding uh, sin. 1 John 1 verse 10. And he says, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. See, we have sinned. We have fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect. If we are perfect, and by definition, we've not sinned, but he said we have sinned. Don't lie. You've sinned, he says. But he says, even if you have sinned, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. For you to come to him, he says, I will forgive you. He, he promises to forgive us. So therefore, don't be in perfectionist prison. Don't be this person who says, I have to be perfect. Otherwise, God's not going to accept me. That's not true. God understands that we are in the flesh and that we are weaknesses. We have struggles. As long as we keep turning to him, repenting, turning away from sin, evil and confessing our sins, he's going to forgive us. He's drawing us near. He's sanctifying us, making us more into his image. And he is he has saved us by faith, not by our own works not by our law keeping. So he's accepted us. And now from that acceptance, we live out our life before him, loving others. Another thing I want to talk about is uh, Yeshua. He said, I'm, I'm coming to you and I, I'm asking you to, if you're heavy and lay, laden, heavy laden, come and bring me your burdens. And he says, take my yoke and learn because I am gentle and lowly in heart. See, he's saying his yoke is easy, so you need to give him your burdens. And, and if what you're carrying right now, then ask yourself, what am I carrying right now? Because if what you're carrying right now isn't light, it's not of Yeshua, because he said that his burden is light. So if his burden is light, let that be what you carry to love one another as he has loved us to keep the greatest commandments. But that is not the burdens of the world. 
And so even the worries of the world, the burdens of the world, you have to give it to him. Be gentle with others. Be gentle with yourself. The next one I want to talk about. See, some of us aren't gentle with ourselves. We're very harsh on ourselves. And because of that, we are struggling to be gentle on other people. In fact, you may look at yourself and and ask yourself, am I really a person of gentleness with others? Because, and then you may say, well, and then you may even excuse it and say, well, yeah, I'm not, may not be that gentle, but you know, they, they, I don't expect that of others either to treat me in this or that way. But see, it's not about that. It's about how God treated you. He treated you with absolute gentleness and mercy, patiently waiting for you to come to repentance and change your life. And so now you have to love yourself in the way that he has loved you first. In other words, you now see God, you have shown me gentleness and mercy and grace. I'm going to now show me myself gentleness, mercy and grace. I am going to allow myself that when I make a mistake to stand up, allow you to pick me up and carry me along. And as I confess, I know you forgive me. So I'm going to be gentle with myself as I learn and as I grow as a person in the spirit. And because of that, then now I'm going to be gentle to other people as well. I'm going to allow them to make mistakes. I'm going to allow them to grow. I'm going to give them mercy. I'm going to give them patience because that's what God did for me. And so, brothers and sisters, some of us next, I want to talk about how some of us are living by the negative words of men. Stop doing that. Start living by the words of God. Whatever people have spoken to you. You know, there's many people who have said all kinds of stuff to me, negative things throughout my life. And if I listened to them, I would be in the ditch doing nothing, feeling inadequate, feeling I cannot do be anything in life. But see, sometimes it's necessary to recognize where the voice comes from. That is of the voice of Satan, the words of negativity that tries to entrap you. See, the word of God may come with correction, but it's also going to come with encouragement. So. It's important that we see his voice because he's trying to to not just correct us, which he, he wants to correct us, but he also wants us to stand up and be free and walk in freedom and walk in the callings and the purposes that he's made us for. Right. And so live by his words. Ask him, what does he say? Pray for his words. Look at it, read his word and grow from it. Stop dreaming the dreams of others. Start dreaming the dreams of God for you. Many of you are looking at other people, other people's callings, other people's giftings, other people's personalities, other people's doors that have been opened for them, other people's ministries, other people, other people, other people. And we keep comparing ourselves to other people. You're dreaming the dreams of others instead of dreaming God's dream for you, instead of living God's dream for you, in fact. See, God has a purpose for you. And it's going to look different from everyone else. You're unique. That's why you have a unique fingerprint. That fingerprint was given as a picture as to calling that he has for you. And you have to stop trying to just be like other people and just try and be like Yeshua. Follow his example. Do what he did and let him carve out your specific individual path in the kingdom and let yourself learn. Let yourself let him take you through the journey, the, the hard lessons, because there's an a, 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 let me say a climax of our lives where we become the and fulfill all the purposes that God has for us. We're all on the way to that place. And after that, right, the Lord's going to take us after we fulfilled our purpose in this life. So we're on this road to that purpose, and that purpose is great. It's wonderful. It's powerful, and it needs a character in you that is refined enough to deal with it. So you have to allow God to carve and and mold your character. And that means through difficult seasons and times and you allowing yourself and God allowing you as he does to make mistakes along the way so you can learn from them and grow. And it's all working together for his glory, for 
his good. And so I want to conclude with this, brothers and sisters, here tonight. <sighs> Do not be ignorant. Satan's objective is one where he wants to put out your fire. He wants to use people. He wants to use situations. And he wants to use his lies through those people and through those situations in order to get you to stop, in order to get you to give up, in order to get you to to crawl into some hole in the ground and wait for yourself to die. Instead of letting yourself die to yourself, stop being a victim, get up and let God's spirit empower you living for him, doing his purposes and will upon the earth because you're no longer a slave to fear, but a child of God. And so then you can love him with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul and with all of your strength. Father, I pray right now, Lord, for everyone who is listening tonight. God, we we have many things that we have gone through. Father, we have many trials and hurts and words that are floating through our minds. Some words are good, some are evil. Father, I pray that you would put a spirit of discernment in your people, that you would open their ears for your voice. You say, my sheep, they hear my voice and the stranger they do not follow. Father, I pray that you would teach them your voice, that they may never follow the voice of a stranger, never believe the voice of a stranger that lies to them and tells them they're not worthy or enough. Father, I thank you that you have come, you have proclaimed that you, and brothers and sisters, I, I actually I feel like the Lord wants me to do something right now. I want you to just just open your eyes from this prayer and look at me. And I want to just proclaim the Lord's words over you. You are enough. You are worthy. You are accepted of the Lord. You are cold. You have purpose, and fear will have its way with you no longer. Put fear away from your midst by putting faith in Christ, by putting your trust back in him. The jealousies, we cast that off in the name of Yeshua. The selfish ambition, we cast that off in the name of Yeshua right now. Father, I thank you for the self-control that you give us. And I want to proclaim over you that you have been given such an open door by the Father. He is literally putting an open door before you. That open door is Yeshua. Yeshua is the way that not only you can be free, but that you can be a vessel used powerfully. He is the open door. He is the way that you reach your full potential. It's not by just reading books that are self-help or something. Like It's by you grabbing a hold of His garment. It's not about you grabbing a hold of who he is and saying, you must do it in me, Yeshua, Holy Spirit, you must change me. Not by my own wisdom, not by the men's knowledge, not by any other way, not by a university degree or going to seminary or by, or by whatever those things could be good. But by the spirit, we must rely on the spirit first and foremostly. He is the ultimate door. He is the way. Get it through your head. He is the way. Not your way. His way. He's the way. But His ways, you must discover them by inclining your ear to Him. So thank you for joining me here tonight. I want to say a special thank you to all of our partners who've been with us. And many of you who've joined us in the chat, I'm just going to scroll here quickly through uh, some of the uh, uh, messages here. And uh, maybe we can read some of them. Aaron says the following. Please pray for my husband, Timothy. If someone cares on here, I have an unspoken request. Father, I just pray right now for uh, Aaron's husband. Husband Timothy, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you, Lord, you know all of this, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would have your hand, your open door, Lord, 
of change in that family's life, Lord, you would come and have your perfect way of deliverance in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Um, Lisa is saying, I used to be hard on myself until the Holy Spirit revealed to me that was a distraction from the enemy, having me forget what the Father has done for me. Hallelujah, Lisa. Reen, thank you so much. It's so good that the Holy Spirit did reveal that to everyone. Don't be too hard on yourself. Karen says, when we are weak, Yah is strong. Praise Yah for drawing you to rely on his strength, Pity. Well, all glory to him. All glory to him. Um, let's see. I'm going to go for one or two more comments here. Dedicated to Yah says the helmet of salvation is over your mind. Remember salvation. Yah is always calling us to remember because we are quick to forget. Remember his testimonies. Remember. Amen. That's good. Remember your salvation. Do not lose sight of it. Do not lose sight because in our salvation, we know that we have security in our father. You need to have security in him. You need to know that that he is like a, a, a husband, right? Who's made a covenant. Like when we have a, a husband or a wife and we have made covenant, that is a promise that is, I'm not going anywhere. I am. I have accepted you, right? For you to become my wife or my husband. And by this covenant that I make with you, I am really proclaiming that I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. That's what we do with one another. And how much more is that not the covenant that our father has come to make with us? Yes, it is, brothers and sisters. He has made covenant with you and he's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. Even when you make mistakes along the way, he will not. So I want to say a special thank you to all of you who joined us tonight. Please share this with your families. Share it with your friends. And let's see deliverance go forth in the body. And I want to say a special thank you to our partners who've made this teaching this week possible. I love you guys and I'll see you in the next one. Shalom.